Cool. Thanks, folks. Um, yeah, so from Linz as well, Wisley, recently. So let's get going. Uh, so my goal is just to sort of talk about what clutter is, so the idea of cognitive load, a little bit of the history, data rank ratio war, maybe it's a chart jump war. I think I'm here. Uh, okay. Cool, cool. And, and then we'll go some techniques and examples and just go a little tour of the course. Cool. Uh, just one of my maps to show I do know how to make maps. It's not all just made up. So things I've created or read about. Um, but anyway, clutter, cognitive load. There's this, this idea that there's, um, there's mental effort required to learn new information so that more that you put on a page, the harder it is to pull the information out of the page. And you've got a, a finite amount. You've got a bucket and once it's reached, you can't take any more in. Um, so a nice sort of analogy for this would be a, a messy bedroom. So stuff all over the floor, it's hard to find what you're after. But you can use drawers, you can use shelves, you can just grab some stuff. And then you will be able to find it. And just a quick map example to illustrate a little bit contrived, because one's from this tiny scientific article, and one's probably a giant poster. But you can see the one on the, probably your left, your right, is um, lots of stuff on the screen, right? Lots of stuff to pick out where the information is versus the other. It's, it's very clean, and it's straight away. I can go to the, the thing that's most important, and I look at that. Uh, so then, yeah, as I said, hard to read. Um, but also the idea of turning the reader away. For them, automatically, it just feels too complicated that it's not for them. And this was, it was a great um, workshop by Chris McDowell at Geocart, where he talked about, as cartographers and spatial folks, we're used to a lot of the symbology, a lot of the stuff. And it's also kind of fun to tease apart um, fully complex visualizations. But that's not your user often. Your user's not that. So don't forget to think about your user, think about their background and where they're coming from. Because you don't want to just turn them off straight away for them to say, this isn't for me, and walk on. And this is just another sort of a take on it. It's from uh, Nancy Duarte, but related to data, data, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But it's the idea of um, signal to noise, where signal is the information that you want to communicate, and noise is the stuff that's getting in the way or distracting you. And then a little example, so Tufty is sort of one of the main proponents here. And you can see the, the top one, there's a lot of information there. A lot of it seems relevant, but it's actually getting in the way of me seeing what I'm meant to be looking at versus the bottom where it's pulled away. And if you look at the bottom right, I only just got pointed this out, so maybe this isn't Tufty's diagram, maybe I nicked it off someone else, but the little guy is like waiting on the tarmac for hours, which was kind of half past yesterday morning, but anyway. Um, and then and we've got Cole. So, so her book, Storytelling of Data, was also one of the big sort of inspirations for this, where she has sort of a really nice section on clutter, basically. But you can see the first, it all feels like relevant information. It doesn't feel like you've wasted my time, but I can't see what I'm meant to see versus the one on the, on the right, where, where it's just highlighted the bits that I need to see, kind of led me through it, removed everything. So it's really easy to, to take on. And it just doesn't, it doesn't feel heavy, right? And this is a map example. Once again, contrived. I just threw something together um, based off one I'd actually seen. But, but lots of layered information on the first one. So really hard to see what I'm meant to see. And then I've just sort of started pulling it apart, using a bit of hierarchy and stuff like that so that it's, it's easy and it, it feels comfortable to go look at. And then we've got a first little, little detour where I just want to talk about sort of the elegant and invisible. And it's one of those, those things that I love where I, I want all these techniques, use the techniques, but I don't want you to notice the techniques. I don't want you to be distracted by these techniques in the background. So the, the, an example of that would be, say, uh, text bubbles, where it can help me read the text. But if I'm distracted and I notice the text bubble, then that's gotten in the way. But if it's subtle and in the background, maybe it's a little faded edge or something, then all I notice is that I'm reading the text and that's it and I move on. So I've got the information and not the craft behind it. So use lots of craft, but, but there's elegance to it, how you go about it. And, and we'll move on to the history, into the, the famous Star Inc. War, Dark Dark Times. But um, hopefully at the end of it, we'll get this idea of what, what is clutter, the sort of data versus other stuff. And it starts with Edward Tufte, with, with the idea of chart junk, which was a pushback against all these illustrations that were appearing in, say, Time magazine at the time, where they had, they had data, but they'd put all this stuff on top of it. And they said, well, if if you're having to use these, then you're, you're obviously using the wrong numbers because numbers shouldn't be boring and then you're disrespecting your readers. And it, it comes from his sort of idea of graphical excellence. It's clarity, precision, efficiency. This is definitely one of the slides I just read, but greatest number of ideas, shortest time, least ink, smallest space. 
which leads to that data ink ratio, which is ink that is data, that stuff you want to see, versus ink that, that isn't. Um, and, and straight away, people were disagreeing, right? They said, look, you're, you're coming from the position of someone in an ivory tower. That's not actually the way the world works. I've got these readers who, I, I need to draw them in. So this idea that boredom is a threat, you know? Um, and, and something interesting, which is why we've got the little chart um, comic there, but yeah. But it was also, he was saying that you're, you're handpicking the ones, the illustration examples. It's not all of them, you're just adding the worst. And, and a 2010 article agreed with this. They looked at the two and they said there was, there was no difference in effectiveness, but the charts were more memorable, you know. But, but once again, it depends upon the audience. So it's always this, this user at the end of the day. What do they come to it knowing? What's interesting to them? Does that just feel superfluous for them? So if you're probably trying to put it in front of John Tufter, you wouldn't do it. You'd do something else, and so on. Um, so, so we ended up with chart junk veto. That, it's not, it's not just data, but it's it's stuff that contributes should be on there. If it contributes and draws you in, makes it more memorable, then that's awesome. But if it's not, then it, it's ending up as noise, and we want to remove it. And and this is our, our second detour, sort of emotional design. So, Don Norman, sort of the, the father of UX, had this book, um, Design of Everyday Things, which the, the kettle's from. But it was how to, it's a lovely little mechanism of, of um, understanding sort of how to use a device, how to use a, a kettle or how to use a door and whatnot. But it said that was way too mechanical. That there's, there's actually this emotional part, which is when he released another book, and he divided it up into three sort of parts. The first two are very immediate reactions, so your visceral and your behavioral, visceral is your, your textures and your colors and what it's like, and behavioral is what it's like to use. Maybe, I don't know, it's a really enjoyable door to open, or maybe it's the, the iPad example. It's fun to use, they've, they've done the swiping, they've done interesting stuff. But then there's reflective, which is the conscious thought layer behind it, which is you thinking about it after the fact and getting it into your memory that way. So are you, have you bought a Tesla? You know, this is my connection to this thing. I'm thinking about this great device and how great it is. And, and for us, like, is, it, is it the data that I'm showing? Have I done it in a way that you're reflecting on the, the information that I've shown? You go, oh, what did that, that mean? That was really interesting. Or that was a weird connection. What was that? You know? So beyond just pure data to, to how, can I, how can I make this memorable? How can I invoke sort of emotions as well? So quite a, you've got a fine art bucket, cognitive load. Don't want to overfill it. We can increase the signal, reduce the noise, and and it's not just purely data. It's these other things which contribute to what I'm trying to say to create a feeling. So we'll move into some some techniques and examples. Oh, I'll just go back. I just I didn't sort of talk about it, but this one here is from Atlas of Design. So it's the idea of chart junk, and it's full of these dark, heavy shadows and. 3D buildings getting in the way of other stuff, so it should should be a bad map, but there's some stuff missing as well. But but it actually creates the whole feeling of this this one, where it was sort of this oppression and talking about this sort of community, and so this feeling of the map and the data came through, even though what should have been clutter and, and wasn't or, or chart junk. But yeah, um, so cool. So techniques, we'll just we'll just look at some ideas, um, but these are all all stuff that you'll use for other reasons in charts, but. Is how can you have a lens of, of clutter of extra information and you know, a signal and noise as you're looking at these? Um, so the first idea, once again, I'll just read. It seems that perfection is not reached when there's nothing left to add, but when there's nothing left to take away. So this idea of of, of sculpture or carving versus versus painting, sort of layering on, layering on versus taking away spatial stuff. We've, we've often got lots of information that we could communicate, and what can you remove? To, to reduce this clutter, reduce this noise and stuff. And, and it's painting as well, you're probably layering on and then you're removing. But but at the end, can you, you put it in, what can you take out to help to help your user? What's the story you want to tell? What information, what do you want to take away? What actions do you want to get from them at the end of it? Um, and there was a, a little study that said it wasn't, it wasn't the number of objects, what was more important is the number of types of objects. So obviously in our minds we group them together and it's how much stuff have you got going on. And it's seven plus or minus two objects that we can store in our memory. And it was quite a cool study. It uses different sort of online maps to find areas of clutter and what did people think about. It's the same place, but how they, what they had chosen made the feeling of cluttered or not cluttered. Uh, and this is just a topo example that came from a, a really cool chat I had with our cartos about uh, hedgerows. It was also about um, homesteads as well. But but you can see with the with the aerial imagery, there's lots of hedgerows there that haven't been included in the map. But we don't need to include them. We've got the hedges, we've got fields, we've got stuff that gives us a feel that it's a 
it's a crop growing area, right? It's lots of little townships and stuff like that. We know what the area is without having to have all of the information. And it was the same with the, um, the named homesteads. You can have some homesteads which gave you a feel that it was uh, historically a farming area and that gave you the feel of the landscape. You didn't need to have everything, what's the name for every single building, even if there was room on the map. And this is just another example. It's more, it's about the, the, the centre there with Ukraine. It's, it's missing stuff. It's only got roads, it's only got cities, it's got rivers. But I don't know the place, but I get a feel for where the population would be in the place. And then the information that I want to see, all the stuff going on on the edge, I can delve into. So all my, my bucket's filled up by that and not by the other stuff. I've just got the context from that, which is, which is perfect. Uh, and now we'll, we'll move into a little bit of contrast, and it's just how we differentiate. And this is used by both visual hierarchy and by layout. Uh, so this is a really nice one from, from Blog and Nightingale, a visual uh, data viz uh, online thing. Um, and it's the idea of cluttered, decluttered, but focused. So we can remove the clutter, but that's, that's not enough because I don't know where to look. It's still a whole lot of information on a page. But focus, then I'm, I'm stepped through. I said, what do I want to see first? What should I be led through? And I, I can guide the user that way. But it also breaks it up that it's not a bunch of information up front. It's this bit of information and now this bit and now this bit. And, and this is just a map example, you know, like you could think of it as visual hierarchy, but there's actually a lot more. There's choices they've made. They've put it in the centre. They've done sort of some stuff with layout and they've, you know, obviously the visual hierarchies are the, the, the big bold text sort of stuff. But, but it's how they're focusing on on that piece of information. So visual hierarchy itself, we should all know it, but it's emphasising, de-emphasising based on importance. So what's the information that I care about presenting and is that visually the most, the most obvious thing that I see first up? Um, but a lack of order is the idea of disorganised, haphazard and uncomfortable, especially uncomfortable, you know, like it doesn't need to be, a map, map's not for me, I feel like I could, I could read this map, but I just can't be bothered now. There's too much going on, is it worth my time or effort? And, and that's probably because I look at it and I just, it feels full on, and I, I just, no, no thanks. So, uh, a hierarchy, this is this is the idea of bandwidth from Daniel Huffman's talk on monochrome mapping, um, where we broke it down into monochrome to remove all these other little variables. Basically, you, you had a, map, a bandwidth, you had a light to dark, and if you want to have that order, you needed to have enough space in between so that I could tell what the order was. It wasn't just all a mess of, oh, these are light ones, but I don't know what the order is but also similar ones grouped together. So, so can we remove clutter by, by separating things out using this, this idea of bandwidth? And then, and then just a topo map. Topo map is a masterclass, right? Like you've got the one, there's, there's a hell of a lot of information on there. You can see houses and roads and all sorts of stuff. But if I look at the main one, I'm, I'm not drawing away going, well, that's too much. It's, it's just lighting to me. You know, I know there's, there's lots of symbology you've got to learn in a topo map and stuff, but it's, it's done really well. It's a nice place to go for ideas. And then, and then another nice example, different example again, but there's a lot of information actually on there. You've got, maybe you can't see it on the screen, so I don't know, but there's a lot of houses and roads, but they're sunk into the background because they're light grey. So, so lots of information, but I, I can take it in order. I can see it and get the story out of it. Uh, and, then, and then layout, um, this, there's a certain way that you read a page and you can see this eye tracking with the, the colours down there. So there's F scanning where you start at the top and you move along. Um, for us it's also really important with the, the centre of the page, people will look there first. But it's breaking things down by what order are they going to read them in so that I can give them just this bit of information, then this, then this and not everything at once. Is the centre of your page got lots of stuff, then how can you, how can you do something with that? And the, the edges was taken from that storytelling with data and it was more about charts because they would have text all over the show and you wouldn't, you'd get a bit lost because it'd be all different aligned. But as soon as you put it all to left alignment and sort of uh, had to shared borders and edges, it, it became ordered and easy to read and, and you started getting this idea of, um, I trained them how to read it, they knew that it was all going to be left aligned. And you can do that with lots of other stuff too, right? You can have similar symbology, similar ways of doing it. So I'm training you on how to read my map, making it easier. Uh, and then balance and white space. So just this idea that becomes too unbalanced, things shift to one side and it can feel cluttered and part of a map. The whole map doesn't need to have everything. 
and, and then white space. And the first is definitely just a reminder myself to take a breath, because I start talking fast as soon as I do presentations, but it's also like a mental breath as you're reading a map. It's a chance to, to not just go information, 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 to have a, a space to take it in, what I'm trying to tell you. Um, and then this Japanese idea of ma, which I've read a, I heard about in another design talk, but it was to consider the white space as, as part of the whole. It's not just uh, information and then background, you know what I mean? It's, it's all together and how do I use these spaces as part of my techniques. And, and this, this rhythm of entrance used to create uncluttered experiences. So um, I'll show it in the next slide, but this, this idea of a rhythm and it's all part of it. So you can see it's information, space, information, information, sort of going like this and I'm creating spaces to think and breathe. And, and you can see it in the text, it's pretty obvious that there's, there's groups and I can choose to interact with them or not, but also in the visuals themselves with the colors that you've, you've got your, your reds, your greens, your purples. So there's a, there's a space there. To, to think about them individually and to not just be overwhelmed. And, and as I was sort of saying before, it's a chance to reflect. So it can be that I've seen the information and then, but oh, that's an interesting, interesting spatial phenomenon. What's going on there? And then the reflecting, it's getting into your memory, or you're thinking about it more deeply, or taking it in, you know. And and this one, the study was saying that it was it was not the space, but how it was arranged. You know? And I like this example because it's actually got quite a bit of text going on there. And if it was all together, it would be overwhelming for me. But because it's in little chunks, I can read one of them, get a feel for what the other chunks will be, and choose where I want to go to read the others or not. But I can still have all the information on the page. Um, and then and then other techniques. So this is just a really a tour de force. Like those are only a couple of things, a couple of thoughts to look at, you know. But you can look at generalization, reducing complexity. So if it's a village, do I just need enough houses to show that there's a little village there and that will be enough. I don't need all of the things. Same with rivers or roads, you know, what do I omit and put in? And you get out the idea of grouping. So we saw earlier that it was the number number of types, not the number of objects. So can I use some of these other little sort of subconscious things that you do to pull things together as a whole to divide up the information that way? And, and then finally clarity. If if you can read certain parts really well, then they can be overlaid. So like a token, that would be a lovely example of this, where a lot of the, the cutouts in the text, where I can read it so it doesn't feel cluttered, but there's still lots of information overlaying. Uh, and, and then the summary. So reduce cognitive loads, so you've got a finite bucket, there's only so much people will take in, how can you pull that away? What can you enhance? What can you remove? A signal or noise? Can you add a bit of order? Can you add some space to, to sort of give them a chance to think? And, and ultimately make it intuitive, easy to read, just you know automatically how to read it, but also it's welcoming, you feel like it's for you, it's not someone else's. And then that just leads to the, the user first and foremost, all these decisions based off what, what they know and where they're coming from. Um, so I'm pretty good at talking really fast, obviously, when I do presentations. I was worried I wouldn't be on time, I'm two minutes early, so pew pew. But, um, uh, but thank you, um, and I'll be outside as well, if there's any other questions. Okay, we've probably got time for a couple of questions. So raise your hand, wait till the microphone gets to you and then go for it. Hi, I'm just wondering, uh, are there additional challenges when it comes to dynamic visualizations like web maps and stuff? Um, how do these principles transfer to something like that? Yeah, yeah, I think I think there's additional tools that you can use to help you, you know, so you've got scale dependent symbology, so you can choose to show more, more as you zoom in, and then less as you zoom out, and then what, what do I need to show you enough of as I've zoomed out that you'll know to go to that place and zoom in further, I guess, or whatnot. Uh, similar with the menus, you know, like that was talking about um, um, Don Norman with the DUX, you know, can I hide complexity, have menus that then drop out to be more menus, you know, I don't need it all on there, I don't need lots of buttons all over the screen and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, uh, there were definitely lots of other stuff that I haven't thought of, but even more so that, that Z sort of scanning, like that's a lot of web page stuff uses that as a tool to, to guide you around the page. So can I, as, you, as you've hit it, can I lead you up and tell you about what's going to go on first? And then if you scroll down to the page and do your things on the slide and understand what to use to move you on through the rest of it, yeah. But yeah. Um, do you have a favourite resource with really nice examples of all the principles you've laid out in mapping? Because um, obviously there are a lot 
for more, I guess, traditional data visualization, even like flicking through Tufte's books and there are a few, I guess, yeah. more contemporary authors. Um, yeah, do you have a, a really good resource for, for the, I guess, mapping examples? Um, not so much. I'll, I'll have to look it up here. There's a, a blog post, a, uh, a web page from a university in America that does a lot of really nice cartography stuff and leads you through, but not so much this. Uh, Alberto Cairo is a nice another one to read books on. He's quite cool. Um, and Tufty. Just, he's got some nice... He's got a book, and I can't remember which one it is. Envisioning information? No, I don't know. But it definitely has... Carto keeps coming up in it as the examples that he uses to, to think about this. Yeah. 